Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a little bit late. Because my MacBook Pro decided it was time to do all of the updates. All of them. Now, can I start my MacBook? Just wait a minute. We're still thinking. Technology. The Archons. It's Archontic Interference, I tell you. Now, let's go straight to the questions, and then I'm going to take some of your questions live in a moment. These are the questions that were asked today. Ah, yes, okay. Let's start here. Um, I will never, ever, 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 ever contact you via Telegram or WhatsApp personally. Um, I will never, ever, ever, ever uh, contact you and say, are you interested in investment? Are you interested in crypto or, or anything like that? Um, it, it's not, it's not my thing. Uh, these are scam accounts. Do not talk to them. Do not give them money. So if there's a YouTube comment and underneath the YouTube comments, it says, Oh, hi, it's Richard here. <laughs> Come and join me. And here's a number. And the number is a plus one, which is America and Canada. I live, I'm a do I'm a resident of the United Arab Emirates. I have a United Kingdom mobile number and a UAE mobile number. So it's either plus four or plus nine, seven, one, that's, that's me. And I don't give that number out. Nobody has that number. You don't need it. I don't do crypto. Um, I'm not involved in investments and I'll never ever contact you directly. If it doesn't have my face on it, you can, you, it's probably not me. I have a telegram group. Um, I have an official email and I will never, ever, ever ask you for money outside of Stripe or PayPal, where all your payments are completely secure. So I have heard, I heard in a seminar in Serbia, um, a woman gave one of these guys some money, which is a real shame because there's nothing you can do. You can't, you can't get it back. I have uh, called uh, once and was uh, sworn at uh, by a group of young men who put the phone down and just verbally abused me basically i can't stop them the police can't stop them so please be aware that's not me let's get straight into the uh other questions because i was asked here was this really you i got a notification supposedly from richie on a whatsapp number no uh, i've got a right strategy for a new project investment no no crypto no investments it's not me have narcissistic personalities increased in prevalence as a result of how our society has developed or have we just become more informed and aware of their existence also is it common to struggle to comprehend how these people think meaning i understand the theory but it's just challenging for me to understand rationalize or accept that these individuals actually think the way that they do it just doesn't compute. It feels completely incompatible with how humans should think and behave. So let's start with the first question. Have narcissistic personalities increased in prevalence? Um, it's unlikely that actual full-scale narcissistic personality disorder has increased in prevalence because the circumstances that allow that personality disorders to develop are very, very unique and specific. Full-scale narcissistic personality disorder requires a simultaneous spoiling and putting and pampering of a child and abuse at the same time. And it needs to be ongoing. It needs to be inescapable. We are seeing a rise in highly narcissistic traits. Now, the reason for that is pretty simple. It's a, pro a process um, that's just a case of the gravitational pull of our culture. Behind everything, the context, the invisible context, in which any debate, any conflict, any major world issue that's reported in the news takes place is the economy. It's, it's actually, you could argue that at root, a lot of this is actually uh, economics. So what are the economics that are at play here that affect narcissism? Well, the world, not the West. Don't say the West. There's no such thing as the West versus the East anymore. There probably hasn't been since the 80s. If they have internet and they have Instagram, it's the West. The world, therefore, is addicted to a very, very predatory form of capitalism. I, though I am left of center, 
I am a capitalist. I believe if you make something with your work, you get to keep all your stuff. That's capitalism. You keep your capital if it's yours. You should be kind if you can be kind and if you're a mind to being kind and it's your choice, then be kind. It's nice to be kind. It's good to be kind. The governmental levels in most countries, uh, civilized countries in the world, though we think we live in capitalist countries, we actually all have a blend of socialism and capitalism. It's yin and yang. So that's the politics side of it done. What about capitalism? You just said you're a capitalist. Yes, I think the way governments run now, it's a bit crap, but it's yin and yang, it's balance. We have capitalism and socialism. And there's you, you can't name a country that's purely socialist or, or purely capitalist. I challenge you in the comments to try. Just because it says the communist people's republic of Bibbidi-boo doesn't mean that it's actually a communist or a socialist country. They're usually a mix and that's fine. However, there is something called corporatism and there is something called consumerism. Bear with me, kids. We are still talking about narcissism. If the economy, if the global economy is addicted and by addicted, I mean heavily addicted. Like if you took out what I'm about to say, our global economy would collapse within a week if you took it away so you have corporatism that's not capitalism that's not like you can't have massive monopolies that take over and crush all of the other competition that's called corporatism consumerism consumer capitalism means what you're doubling down on is pushing people into buying stuff that they want not stuff that they need um i'm going to do it with my fingers yes okay so Here's uh, human uh, needs and here's what's out there to be purchased. So I need a horse, a bag of corn and a cart. And there's my human needs. What's in the market? Some horses, some bags of corn and some lovely carts. Oh, that's nice. Clip, clop, clip, clop. Everything's okay. Hmm. I want to make more profits. Well, they've got everything they need. They have a horse, a bag of corn. No, I want more profits, but they don't need any more. Make them want more. I can't make them want more. Tell Satan to make them want more. So then we go to Satan and we say, Satan, this good person over here who only needs a bag of corn, a horse and a clip, clop, clip, clop cart, he doesn't want anything else, but we have loads of shit to give him. And Satan says, okay, sign this contract in your blood for your souls and the souls of your consumers, and I will make them want to buy more stuff. How will you do this? I'll just increase their lust and avarice and greed so that they buy stuff that they don't need anymore. Wow, Satan, that's great. Yes, it is. And then they suckle on the devil's titties. That's how it works. This is an economic lesson. Pay attention. So what does Satan do? He takes the deadly sins. He takes rage. He takes envy. He takes lust and avarice and sloth. And he just plunges this into the mind of this innocent civilian. I just wanted a bag of corn and a cart and the, the horse. No, no more, more, more corn, more car, big cart, bigger horse, horse on steroids, cart with flamethrowers. I don't need that. Well, then I'm gonna hurt you until you do. And so then you traumatize the consumer into thinking that if he doesn't have the cart with the flamethrowers and gold covered corn and a horse on steroids that can fly, he feels bad by provoking the seven deadly sins, by provoking his greed, his lust, his rage, whoever like made him feel inferior at school or whatever, he's going to shall shall show them so you inject the consumer with evil with evil poisonous nasty narcissistic intent and you tell them this was a man before by the way this was a man and you know what he needed corn for because he had a wife and children and he wanted to feed them and he needed a horse and a cart to go and farm and make more corn and trade that with the other people in the village for like a sword or getting the hooves, the shoes of the hooves of his horse fixed or getting a nice new wheel so that he could go and feed his children. This was a simple man who wanted protection 
and he wanted to live. He just wanted to live and be left the F alone to go farm and make more children with his wife. And that's it. But the corporations in league with Satan and Satan's titties, they injected him with evil and made him want more. And then they said, but we have more stuff. We want more profit. What do we do, Satan? And Satan said, don't worry about that. I'm already thinking of marketing strategies to target his wife. I've already thought of marketing strategies to target his kids. I'll drive them all completely insane and fill them all with greed and lust and rage. I'll hurt them all. I'll traumatize them all. Non-traumatized consumers are useless. Useless. I, I, I'm a marketeer. I'm, I've been doing sales and marketing since 2004. You can't sell to people who are non-traumatized. You can't sell to people who don't need anything. You can't sell to people who are emotionally regulated and are just getting on with their lives and they're fine. That's not how marketing works. You need marketeers, Satan's minions, to convince people that they'll never be happy unless they have the dinky do. So these people over here, the corporations are like, wow, we have slaves in mines and in darkness. We've enslaved children. We've enslaved the old. We've enslaved everybody. We don't really pay them anything. They're in such horrifying conditions that they try to kill themselves daily and it's like a whole other job that we have to try and stop them from murdering themselves because it's so painful being forced to work for us. Now we have a bunch more stuff and we want more profit. What do we do now? We've topped out the greed and the evil and the lust. And they go to Satan and Satan says, we ain't topped out anything, homies. We can do better than this. And then he injects them more with more evil. This dude with his horse and his corn and his cart was a man. His wife was a woman and his children were children, and they were all humans. After the corporation signed the deal with Satan, they are no longer humans. They are uruk -hai. They are uruk -hai from Lord of the Rings. They are now screeching, monstrous, dark, mutated orcs, full of rage, full of lust, full of despair, full of envy, full of violence. Violence is great. Violent people that consume they consume, they eat their rage. They consume everything because they're furious and frustrated and they don't know what to do, especially if the violence uh, is covering and rage is covering desperation and despair. You have to kill their gods. You have to kill their communities. You have to kill love. You have to kill everything that makes living on this planet as a human being worthwhile. You crush every last thing. You smash it down. Break everything. Break all the people. When they're heartbroken and empty and they're all walking around shopping malls like this <laughs> with a thin line of drool or like this, <laughs> I'm looking at the new thing. Will it be enough, master? No, no. You buy that and then you'll buy the next thing. Work with slaves. And what you have is consumerism. This man used to be a man, and now he is a consumer. The most wretched form of life you can find on this earth. An eater of things, an enjoyer. <coughs> enjoying, just enjoying stuff. A whole panoply of choice, endless options of pleasure, Endless pleasures without satiation ever. Non-stop pleasure. Just tickle my pleasure centers wherever you can. Don't stop until I'm dead. That consumerism breeds some nasty uh, personality traits for that. Remember I said of the deadly sins, there's lust, there's envy, there's rage. Sound familiar? It's evil. This is despair. This is despair writ large. Now, if you're a consumer, I need you to think of yourself as a thing that consumes, not as a human being living a life, not as a spiritual being have a human, having a human experience on earth. Occasionally you meet with other spirits and you talk to them and you laugh and you dance and you play 
in nature where it's beautiful and you feel calm and happy. No, put them in the traffic with the trucks, with the big machinery building bigger and bigger skyscrapers, huge steel penises jutting out into the sky, just spurting out the devil's pollution into the earth. We need more of that because if there is community and there is love and there is sanity, the global economy collapses. This is not a joke. I have made myself sweat. That's not a joke. The global economy is literally addicted to consumerism. We are now even consumers of war, even consumers of war. Now you might say, how are we consuming war? Anything where you get to fulfill your dark ego needs, by choosing a side, by representing a side, that's consumerism, you're consuming war, you're consuming human suffering, you're consuming death, you're consuming death. When you make that choice, and then you go online into the social media space where we have communities and followers, they're not even hiding the language, and we're building our stories online, that's consumerism, you're consuming death, you're consuming war. So is narcissism on the rise? You're goddamn right it is. You're goddamn right it's on the rise. But NPD, narcissistic personality disorder, let's see. Let's see. Maybe the conditions that we're creating with uh, globalism, with corporatism, with consumerism could create full-blown narcissistic personality disorder in full-grown adults because usually it would require they were traumatized in childhood. But then people are so fucking infantilized now and so traumatized now, maybe it will work. You know what I think we need to do, Satan? I think we need these virtual reality pods. I think we got to put them in the pods. Put them in the pods. And then you can have what is required for narcissistic personality disorder. A full scale psychotic break from reality. Just sink into your own delusional grandiose fantasy. You can be a goddess. You can be a god, you can be a warrior, you can be a powerful witch, the queen of the elves, whatever the fuck you want to be. And there you can stay. And then we can create narcissistic personality disorder. But for now, for now, we're hitting our upper limits for evil by just provoking trait narcissism. So yeah, narcissism is on the rise. That was the shorter answer to your question. Oh, you can all hear me, okay. Uh, what was the second part of your question? Oh yeah, is it common to struggle to comprehend how these people think? Not when, not when it's explained the way I just explained it to you. Um, it's satanic evil. It's demonic evil. It's a demonic form of brainwashing. Um, if you want somebody to embrace evil, then you do evil to them in childhood, and you shatter their minds. You split their minds up. This is how mind control slaves have been created. Well that we know that it can be tracked, that has been admitted, at least in the last century. Uh, severe childhood abuse creates uh, mentally split childhood slaves. Mentally split um, slaves, but you have to do it in, uh, in childhood. You have to get them there. Um, is it common struggle to comprehend how these people think? Uh, well, if you're not insane, yes. Meaning, I understand the theory, but it's just challenging for me to understand, rationalize, accept that these individuals actually think the way they do. It just doesn't compute. It feels completely incompatible with how humans should think and behave. I understand. Um, just give me a moment. My nose is running. I'll mute this because you don't need to hear that, and I'll stop the camera. I'm coming back. Don't go into abandonment anxiety. It'll take me 60 seconds.
Ugai. Little joke for you. Did you enjoy that? <clears throat> um, did you see the film The Predator in the 1980s? In the 1980s, special effects weren't as good as they are today. So in order to show you the subjective experience, so the predator is a predatory alien life form that comes to Earth, comes to all planets to hunt. It's for pleasure. It's like um, uh, sort of a bourgeoisie alien, and he likes to hunt inferior forms of life because it's a dangerous and fun form of sport. In the 1980s, the graphics weren't that good, so they just heat mapped everything to show you what the alien saw. So when we, the audience goers, I don't know how old you are, if you're too young, you wouldn't have bothered watching Predator. That's why I'm saying this. And if you're the same age as me, you'll just have to enjoy it for the people who are too young to remember, such as life. So the, when we saw the Predator's point of view, we saw heat. We saw heat. The Predator, uh, the super advanced alien life form that had conquered interstellar travel, had shitty heat-seeking eyes, and that was all it could do, which is a bit weird. Um, but okay. So imagine you're the predator. So you said you struggle to understand the subjective experience of a narcissist. So imagine you're the predator. So you're chasing Arnold Schwarzenegger and a group of special forces soldiers through the jungles of, I can't remember where, I think it was somewhere in South America. Um, and you're tracking humans and you see heat. now. Your target as a predator is human life and your objective is to kill. So you track heat. Got it? Now imagine you're the same creature, but you walk into a bar full of people and you're not tracking human life, you're tracking power. And your heat map glows where power is. Power could be sex, it could be money, it could be status, it could be access. But you can walk into a room and you can scan and you can see power. You can see where you can see narcissistic supply. You can see attention. You can see ways of elevating your status in the world. That should give you more of a sense of what it is the narcissist is looking at the world for. When they see a person, they scan them and they map for vulnerabilities and strengths because they're looking for power. If I map your vulnerabilities, imagine that you're the predator again and you're looking at me and you just have this gift, you can just scan me, but not with your human eyes, with your alien predator eyes, you can see every vulnerability. You can see every, uh, instinctually, you can see my childhood trauma. You can see where I'm weak. You can see where I need reassurance. You can see where I'm delusional. You can see where I'm not shadow integrated. You can see where I'm immature or lustful or greedy or rageful. And you can use these seven deadly sins against me. It is annoying me, I can't remember the seven deadly sins. Sunday, it's a sermon. Deal with it. I don't want it in Greek. Do I like and read Greek? Oh, in Greek, it's funnier. Oh, okay. Oh my God, what are this? <laughs> the fourth century monk, Evagirus Ponticus, reduced the nine logissimoi to eight as follows Gastrimagia, gluttony. It's got the word gastri in it. We could have got that. Porneia. Pornea is prostitution, fornication, philargyria, avarice, lipe, sadness. How is that a sin? Orge, wrath, Acadia, uh, dejection, kenotoxia, boasting, hyperphania, pride. So what we've got today is gluttony, lust, avarice, uh, despair, wrath, sloth, vanity, and pride. God, I needed that. I need to get out of my system. Um, so you said it's difficult for you to understand how they view the world. So they have a different way of viewing the world that you do. The other thing to understand is the structure of the narcissistic personality disordered individual is not the same as your structure. They're not coming from authenticity. They're not coming from um, authentic emotional engagement ever. What's happened is that at some point, this is my um, pet hypothesis is my pet the model it's not the orthodoxy is i think the child at some point said no so the root of narcissistic personality disorder is a childish denial of reality and when i say childish i mean childlike toddlerish i don't mean childish as in emotionally immature though of course they were it's the toddler trying to set a boundary against that which is unacceptable no no so that it's a no so you push back 
and you create a shield around you and you, you're the narcissist now, you're in their subjective reality and you're a child and you create a shield around you. Inside of the egg that is a shield is your fantasy version of yourself, is your fantasy version of your life, is how important and wonderful you are. Reality gets in because the, the eggshell, the shield is opaque, but it comes in in a very, very fractured way. And as it's coming through the shield that you've designed, it transforms from ugly and negative about you, all the negative feedback about you, you're constantly trying to retranslate into positive feedback about you. So you now live doing two jobs. Narcissists are never just perceiving narcissistic personality disordered people, excuse me, let me be specific with my language, are never just perceiving reality. They're perceiving and doing, obviously we're all perceiving and reinterpreting reality. Yes, yes, okay, got it, thank you, bad ants. But they're doing a big job of reinterpreting reality. They're really recasting reality. And their brain isn't thinking, oh, I'm perceiving and then reinterpreting reality to make it match my previous beliefs and to make sense of the world. They don't want to make sense of the world. That's death. So when you're arguing and you're debating, it's like, come on, let's be adults. Let's go to therapy. Let's have a chat about this. This is going to be okay. They don't want reality. The last thing they want is reality. The last thing they want is the truth of who they really are. They've been denying it since they were children. They're not gonna start now. So inside of this shell, you and I were now two narcissistic personality disorder people. What happens to me? I should be growing. I should be becoming, uh, um, you know, what do we call that? A, a not pre, pre-adolescent child, an adolescent child, a late stage adolescent child, a young man, and then on into middle age, none of it, nothing, 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 none, none. You get through everything that seems adult, the words, the signaling, everything that is projected outward, it's all a mirage. At core, when they break, when they tell the truth, it's a child, it's just a child in there. There is just a very small child in there. Now that's not to say, um, don't fear the child. My God, a child can be extraordinary. I mean, you could, if you were a fly caught by a child having your wings and arms and legs pulled off, you wouldn't think a child was such a wonderful thing. Um, they're not old enough yet to be particularly empathic. They haven't learned yet that when you say and do things to other people, it hurts in the same way it hurts you. That's why when they're very small, there's a bunch of kids here and by the Golden Mile on um, Palm Jumeirah. And um, you'll see them and they're like mini barbarians and they'll stand up and they'll go, ah, ah, and they just scream at nothing. And you're like, why, why is she doing that? Why is he doing that? Because it feels good. They can stand up straight. Can you imagine, well, like we all did it, but probably can't access the memories. Like you were really weak. And then very recently you learned to stand and you can go ah, and scream at the top of your lungs. And everybody will be like, shut up, daddy's got a hangover. But you think it's wonderful. And then you learn you can pick something up and you can just smash it into another kid's head or smash it into your mum's hip. <laughs> and you think that's wonderful. And you have to learn it's not. You have to be told, like, that's that's really not cool. But it makes sense that as a child with no uh, uh, boundaries, no sense of me and you, and no sense of you being in pain because there's just me, it's a completely solipsistic, self-centered world. That's the narcissist. Why are they not compassionate? Why are they not empathic when I tell them it hurts? Why, why do they not care? Why would they care? They have no sense of you. I am in therapy. I think my therapist wants me to be more compassionate to people with narcissistic personality disorder. There is a space for that, but it's not here. It's not here. The people who are here, um, you're full of hope. You're full of hope. and if you are with somebody with narcissistic personality disorder i don't want you to be i want you to live your lives i've wasted years on hope i can say at least now from the age of 30 to the age of 45 minimum on hope hoping that people would change hoping that people get better 30 to 45 they're good years i'm not getting them back i don't want you to make the same mistakes that i don't want you to do i don't want you to lose a year don't do it don't be like me don't hope accept that you're dealing with something else that is not like you. Now, if that human individual made in the image of the Lord Almighty, 
gets up off their stool and goes across the room to therapy. I would say that would be a jolly good idea, don't you, Eli? Yes. If they do that and they get therapy and they get better, alhamdulillah, that's a wonderful thing. We can all rejoice, hallelujah. But that's for that other adult human being to do. It's not for me to do. It's not for you to do. I didn't birth you. You are not of me. Go to therapy. Do not go to therapy. It is your life. Halas. Next question. Um, some say a narcissist, I'm reading the top voted ones, cannot view themselves correctly. Others describe self-aware narcissists. Are there many self-aware narcissists? Is self-aware narcissist an oxymoron? No. All narcissists are self-aware. Where did the uh, falsehood that narcissists have no idea what they're doing come from? Narcissists. It is probably a questionable idea to take advice on narcissism from people who are clinically diagnosed as having narcissistic personalities. Well, because there's a chance, just a smidgen, just a tiny little chance, that they might actually lie and that they might actually misinterpret the facts and that they might confuse you so that you don't set simple, hard boundaries with abusive people and, as I just said, get on with your life so that they, if they choose to do so in the eyes of our Lord, go to therapy if they so wish. People have been lied to about narcissism. And uh, there's a bit of published research that I can lead you to that's oddly enough, given that it is a Sunday and this has turned into a fire and brimstone seminar. It's called Sins. It really, and I started talking about seven deadly sins. I'm not making this up. Um, sins stands for the single inventory narciss narcissism scale or score. And it's from a 2014 piece of uh, uh, research done at a university in America. Which I can't remember now, but I'll look it up in a second. And essentially what they did was they went to students on campus and they approached people on the campus and they said, look, um, here is a description of what a narcissist is like. Do you say that, would you say that this describes you? Yes or no? And some people said no, and some people said yes. The ones that said yes, when they gave them the very rigorous testing for narcissism, the correlation between the single inventory, is this you? Yes or no? And the very, very complicated ones where you can't trick the questions, you can't bluff your way out of it, was correlated extremely positively. Let me give you a bit more data on that for the nerds, for people who actually like reading academic papers. Single inventory narcissism score, not scale. Uh, boop, boop, boop. Ah, yes, Susan Conrath. Uh, development and validation of the single item narcissism score. I, I can't remember the um, the university. And the last time I spoke about this publicly, I got, I got it wrong. So there's Sarah Conrath, Brian P. Mayer, and Brad Bushman. And it was published in 2014. At least I got that right. Um, the objectives, the narcissistic personality is characterized by grandiosity, entitlement, and low empathy. This paper describes the development and validation of the single item narcissism scale. Although the use of longer instruments is superior. So they're saying it's better for you to get a test, uh, a full, a, a full uh, and proper clinical test for narcissism. It is superior. This is based on the statistics that they found. Uh, we recommend the SINS in some circumstances under serious time constraints, uh, online studies. Uh, the results, um, the SINS is significantly correlated with longer narcissism scales. Uh, but uncorrelated with self-esteem. It ha also has high test, retest reliability. We validate the SINs in a variety of samples, undergraduates, 
undergraduates, I don't know why I said that like Sean Connery, undergraduates, much more penny. Nationally representative adults, interpersonal correlates, uh, like for example, positive effect or depression, and interpersonal correlates like aggression, relationship quality, pro-social behavior. The sins taps into the more fragile and less desirable components of narcissism. Now, if you were simply told this is what narcissism is, and you said, yeah, that sounds like me. Can anybody please tell me how that indicates that narcissists aren't completely aware of what it is that they're doing? When the correlation is so high and so positive that that is not as reliable, it is not statistically as reliable, but it's nearly as statistically reliable. They are self-aware. We have to eradicate this fantasy that they're not self-aware. They know that what they're doing is wrong. Look, I have another one for you not based on published research, it's um, anecdotal. Okay, so I've done this a couple of times. Highly abusive relationships with girlfriends who were comorbid with different things like um, eating disorders and, and probably borderline personality disorder and a narcissistic personality disorder. In my humble opinion, I'm not a clinician, not qualified to diagnose in any way you can't diagnose inside of a relationship. Highly, highly narcissistic people. But when we would watch a Netflix show or a movie, they never failed to understand the motivation of every single character in the film or in the TV series. They never stopped watching the show and turned to me and said, I don't understand why Timothy said that to Olivia at that moment. They know perfectly well how the world works. They know what good and bad is. All of this crap that narcissists gaslight you with, it's different in my culture, it's a language barrier, it's an age difference, it's um, a difference of perception, it's this, it's garbage, it's gaslighting. They understand other people's situations, even when they're fictional, perfectly well. But when you pick them up on something that they did, and they can't deny the evidence of it. Oh, you know, I don't really understand. It's not how I was raised. And you'll be there going, you'll do what I did. You do what everybody does. Are they brain damaged? Are they, do they have PTSD? Are they autistic? Why is it that they don't understand simple communication when the context shifts and it's about them? Because they do understand perfectly well and you're being lied to. I shall find another question and then I'll start asking you guys questions in the live. <laughs> What's that stuff? I don't know why I laughed at that. That's not funny. Uh, some things hit me as funny and then I realize they're not that funny. It's phrased strangely. How long? <laughs> <clears throat> How long does your brain take? <laughs> That's not funny. It's not that funny. How long does your brain take to heal from all the discoveries of a narcissist? <laughs> um, as far as, as far as I know, um, it's not it's not causing actual brain damage. It can feel like brain damage. If you're trapped in a situation that's highly traumatizing, what's the part of your brain that gets damaged? What's that thing? It looks like a seahorse. Is that a hip, is that the hippocampus that looks like a seahorse? I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is. It's a hippocampal volume uh, begins to shrink uh, in exposure to extreme trauma. How long does it take your brain to heal? It would depend on how severe the abuse was, your own pre-existing genetic factors, um, your own sort of personality type, your beliefs, your resilience to that type of thing, um, how severe the abuse, how long it went on for, whether you were completely isolated or whether you had the capacity to speak to other people. But look, it's different for everybody. But the good news is you can recover from it. There's no reason, none. And I've been doing this now. I fell into doing this in, in 2012. It's 2023. I probably wasn't doing a particularly good job of it until 2014, 15. Let, let's, let's be generous and say like eight, eight nine years. Um, and I can say with with full confidence, there's no reason why 
unless there's another pre-existing reason that isn't because of narcissistic abuse and you just can't respond to therapy for some reason other than narcissistic abuse. And I'm not aware of any such condition, by the way, none. Um, you, you will recover from narcissistic abuse if you have a really good coach. If, you're, if you have a good coach, a good therapist, a good counselor, you're a very good client, you do all the work that is required, you're vulnerable, you tell the truth, um, you can be egoless and your coach, your counselor can be egoless. When you have your 50 minutes together, when you have your hour together, you just focus on doing the work of healing. Um, I don't see why you can't make a, a full recovery from it. Uh, there is going to be always a, a memory that that can happen, but you want that because probably before you didn't know that it could happen or you were in denial uh, that it could happen and then it did. So you want that there. Okay, um, that's 40 minutes in. I'm planning on doing about another 20. I'll take uh, questions in the comments if you have any. If you can make them uh, one sentence long and have them end in a question mark, that would be fabby dabby dozy. Would a narcissist call another person a narcissist? Yes, of course they would. They'd do anything to gaslight you, confuse you. I had a thought today, like it's quite a common narcissistic tactic to keep you busy, just keep you occupied, keep you moving, keep you guessing, keep you doing stuff like a, like a boxer in the ring. They'll just keep you busy, keep you on your defense, tire you out. Um, it's very unlikely you would be allowed to rest. So watch out for that. Wow. There's a lot of questions just suddenly popped in. Who are we? Okay, I'm going to try and answer them. I'm going to go quick. Do you believe in a fundamental core self or have you moved to the theory of self-states? Um, I never believed in a fundamental core self. Um, I think that's pure Western ideology. I think it's, I think it's, it's a fantasy. It's consumerism, in, in my humble opinion. And I could tell you why, but it would take ages and I'd start ranting and sweating again. Um, there is... There are obviously there are core elements to all human beings, but a self, no, I, I, I don't think so. Uh, a theory of self states, um, the self state theory. Um, I started out doing neuro linguistic programming and I was still studying neuro linguistic programming when I was doing my degree in behavioral psychology. And my head of department was also, even though he's a behavioral psychologist, was also an NLP master practitioner. And he gave us a module that was an elective in the final year called systems thinking. So we studied systems thinking with him. His name is Andy Bass, and he is a very smart guy. You can look him up online. Um, very talented, very smart dude. And um, he taught us about uh, self-states. Uh, there are lots of different systems that have them. I'm currently in therapy at the moment where uh, the therapist is using transactional analysis and they have also models of different self-states that are that are running. So um, neuro-linguistic programming, right, right from, I don't, you know, whatever, NLP is NLP. It's got its strengths, it's got its weaknesses. Um, we were never trained to believe that there was a core, a core self. In fact, it went so far that in the neurolinguistic programming circle I was in, not from Richard Bandler himself. I trained with Richard Bandler a couple of times, um, but not from Richard Bandler himself, but from people that I was working with who, who were associated with him. They said, there's no such thing as personality disorders. That's how much we didn't believe in itself. So I've never, it's never been, you got to remember, like, I'll talk a lot of psychoanalytic theory, but I've only learned psychoanalytic theory in the last, since 2016. So that's what, seven years? So it's, that's, that's all new to me. Narcissism and borderline can be comorbid, question mark? Yes, and frequently are. I'm so tempted. I'm on one. I want to go and look up how comorbid they are, but I'll leave it. Um, but yes, they're highly comorbid, yeah. But I thought... The basic difference is narcissists lash outside themselves at others and borderlines punish themselves. How can that be comorbid? Um, because that isn't the basic difference. You've been misled. Um, everybody should, there's so much information online. Uh, don't take your information from YouTube videos like this without going, like you don't have to go into Google Scholar and read like a full scale study. But at least if you like, if you go on psychology today, 
or something like that. Those are approved clinicians who are writing easy to read articles, but they have citations inside of them. And it, it, it's, it doesn't have to be like really heavy brain battering stuff to be good data or Wikipedia. Wikipedia is, is checked all the time. Um, and that has, when it comes to psychology, it has pretty good uh, and personality, so pretty good up-to-date data, but you're taking stuff from Instagrammers, TikTokers and Facebook posts, and it's going to confuse you. The reason why somebody would say that is because it's, um, God, this is probably a fallacy, but I don't know what the name of the fallacy is. It's like a folklore fallacy or something like that, or an aphorism fallacy. It sounds good. So when I say like, oh, we will go now into the sky, but the sky will also go into us. I sound like the, the dude from, from Mystery Men, if you're old enough to remember that film. Um, so it sounds, it's like pithy. It sounds like a piece of like folklore wisdom. The narcissist hurts others, but the borderline only hurts themselves. Well, that's nonsense. And that's not how personality disorders work. The definition of a personality disorder means that it should be maladaptive not just for the individual, but for the environment. Otherwise, it's not a personality disorder anymore, which is one of the central arguments at the core of the narcissistic personality disorder ongoing debate in the world of American psychiatry. You have to be hurting yourself and you have to be hurting others. Otherwise, that's not a personality disorder. It's called something else. So I can see why, why somebody would say that. And it would be like, I do it sometimes like, I, I give people stuff to try and remember, and I'm like, that's not strictly true. But what you've been told there, as tempting as it is to say this like pithy, folkloric, wise, wise aphorism, it's just not true. It's just, it's just so not true. Um, BPD will hurt other people. And uh, that triggers people in the comments like, no, BPD people are wonderful. They're perfect angels. I'm like, but I'm working from the literature. Like, I'm not working from the advice of hipsters on TikTok and, you know, unemployable 30-somethings with pierced septums who want to educate me about what borderline personality disorder is or isn't because I'm slob, half-educated counsellor drooled out, I think you have BPD, out of the corner of the mouth without actually clinically testing them. A few things I need to work through with my therapist there. It's in the literature. Like, it's... <laughs> Go and look, like go and look up the the traits of of BPD. Now, if you come back to me and say, "Well, I don't agree with those definitions of BPD," I can have that conversation with you all day. Or you say, "I don't agree with the institution of psychiatry." I can have that conversation with you, not you, questioner, with anyone all day. Not uh, Mary, your name is. I'm now not talking to you. I'm talking to generally. I'm talking to the, the the audience at large. What I can't deal with is people who say, "I have a BPD diagnosis." Okay, so you're submitting to the institution of psychiatry and the orthodoxy. Yes, but my BPD diagnosis means I'm qualified to tell you what BPD is. No, 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 that's not how it works. And then they go further. They say, actually, what BPD is this? I was diagnosed with BPD and I love playing video games. So therefore, all people with BPD love playing video games. I'm like, why are you getting this from? This is madness. That's not how it works. You're either submitting to the orthodoxy. I'm a, I'm a rebellious person. If you don't want to submit to the orthodoxy, I'll stand right next to you, comrade. But you can't say, I fully accept my BPD diagnosis. And now I'm changing it. You can't do that. It's one or the other. So BPD highly comorbid with um, other, tons of other mental health issues. The top one, come on, you read this four days ago. I think the top one is bipolar, but I think that's because it's a misdiagnosis. When I looked at the little bit of literature and I'd, I'd spent like 15 minutes on this, I think the top one was bipolar. Um, there's other emotional dysregulation disorders. It's frequently comorbid with um, uh, eating disorders, uh, depression, anxiety, as you would expect but it's a highly comorbid disorder. Narcissistic personality disorder I read recently is one of the most highly comorbid disorders that there are. So it's very rare for narcissism to be diagnosed on its own. Narcissistic personality disorder is not common as a pure diagnosis. It's usually comorbid with something else and it's frequently comorbid with BPD and psychopathy. BPD frequently comorbid with, well, as I just said, statistically bipolar, but that's because clinicians are like one clinician says BPD and the other clinician says bipolar. So it's a, that's like a confusion. Um, and other mood-related disorders, other mood-related disorders, and occasionally 
narcissistic personality disorder. That's a conversation we can have, but we'll have it another day. Let's get on with the other questions. Sorry, I went on a bit there. What is the percentage to meet with you in person? None, over 50%. I don't meet with people in person. What, what do you mean meet with me in person? From what percentage? 50% of nothing is nothing. I don't know what you're saying. I, I don't know what that means. I'm so sorry. Uh, would you say narcissistic collapse is calculated revenge or is it pure rage? See how long it takes for me to pull up what narcissistic collapse actually is. Oh yeah, that was a pretty good definition right at the top here. So um, you can use a search engine uh, first to check uh, these kinds of questions. So narcissistic collapse um, is not a form of revenge. Narcissistic collapse occurs when a narcissist's ability to uphold their grandiose confident image is threatened. As a result, they often become enraged, resulting in impulsivity, intense lashing out or harm to others. Verywellmind.com. Oh no, let's go Psych Central. Signs of narcissistic collapse. Narcissistic collapse is an intense emotional reaction experienced by a narcissistic person when they sense a setback. It can lead to withdrawal or vindictive behaviors. The signs of narcissistic collapse may vary from person to person. In general, it may involve intense emotional reactions and a tendency towards vindictive behaviors, but it could also lead to depression and withdrawal. So when you're looking at this type of thing, like if you, if you thin slice and you go, oh, well, somebody over here was talking about narcissistic collapse and it was, it, they made it sound like it was something purely vindictive. When you actually go, it doesn't, like I said before, it doesn't take long. These are good sites. You know, they can't, when I say good sites, there's crap on there as well, obviously, but Psych Central has to be checked. Um, what was the other one I referenced before? My brain's going. What was the other one I said? There's another psycho psychology site. Easy to read stuff, but it gives you like a, a broader sense of what we're talking about when we're using these terms. So, uh, the, the narcissistic collapse isn't a permanent, permanent occurrence when it occurs. Typically, the emotional pain will decrease and the person may return to feeling their usual. So it, it, it's intense emotional reactions, a tendency towards vindictive behaviors, depression, but it could also be depression and withdrawal. So um, you've asked, is it calculated? It's, so you're probably talking about vindictive behavior that, could, that can come from narcissistic collapse or narcissistic injury, narcissistic rage. Some of it will be calculated. Some of it will be purely rage based. It depends on the person. It depends on the circumstances. So if it's calculated, it's because they've already pre chosen um, a particular strategy for getting inside and, and wounding you in a certain way. If it's pure rage, it's because of like the pure white hot flash rage my humble opinion, not the orthodoxy, that's because you've really caught them off guard. You've really actually shocked them. And it's, it's the rage is, um, is kind of covering up a terror. You've got to remember that that's a child, the narcissistic shell that they've been living inside of is a life raft that they've been clinging to their whole lives. When they think they're going to lose their grandiose image of who they are, that they experience is a kind of uh, uh, death terror. They really think they're in a certain sense going to completely disappear and die. Oh. Oh. That's like letting murderous psychopaths define themselves. Um, I wouldn't because <laughs> all BPD is a murderous psychopath. That's a bit harsh. Uh, I mean, but BPD can be um, comorbid with psychopathy. It frequently is. That was another one, actually. Sorry, I forgot. BPD is frequently comorbid with uh, antisocial personality disorder, sort of otherwise known, formerly known as psychopathy. I tell you what, I've done a bit of reading in the last two weeks. I sound like you know what I'm talking about, but I'm on the blag, just blagging it, you know. 
just a bouncer from Liverpool that was filling people in last year and now I'm bluffing it on the internet, doing a bit of that psychoanalytic theory, lads. Do you know about Freud? going to bang your house in a minute. Um, do you believe your brain is trying to tell you? I love when people say this about brains. I don't know why it's so funny. <laughs> it's because it's kind of pink and squidgy. Do you know I'm brain damaged? I'm genuinely, authentically brain damaged. I have a TBI. I was hitting the head too many times, and then someone doing martial arts, they yanked my head forward. They smashed me in the head. They gave me multiple hairline fractures. They broke the plate behind my nose. Um, that meant that I couldn't submerge myself in water for 12 months. I couldn't have a bath or dive in the sea or dive in a pool. I could shower um, because of the meningitis risk. So multiple hairline fractures going from the front to the back, plate behind the nose are broken, brain fluid spurting out of my nose, Cere cerebro uh, um, spinal fluid <coughs> came out my nose. I was deeply concussed. I was in, I was in the hospital in London there. And uh, I spoke to uh, an ear, nose, and throat doctor recently for problems that I have with my nose. And she's like, oh, no, your nose is, is, a, is a mess. And I was like, oh, okay. And they scanned my head. She said, um, the, the damage you have to your skull and the notes that we have here, we would usually associate with car crash victims. <laughs> I've been hit in the head one too many times, so you'll have to bear with me. Uh, do you believe your brain is trying to tell you something? Yes, it's saying, go to bed, Richard, before you say something completely mad that you can't take back. <laughs> when you dream of them, often, oh, how awful. Oh, the dreams. The dreams. Oh, the pain. Oh, the nightmares. What is your brain trying to tell you when you dream? I mean, I don't know. Dream analysis is fascinating. I've always recommended on this channel, Dream Hawk. Um, dreamhawk.com the dream dictionary there is very good um, is it a warning to not go back is it a representation of your fear of them I don't know I really don't know you'll have to speak to somebody who's more into dream psychology than I am I haven't really done dream analysis in about 10 years or so I don't think but yeah interesting question definitely how do you reinforce your boundaries to a narcissist for them to finally accept them? They never will. They never will. Your boundaries are meaningless drivel to them. That's why uh, you're, you're just you're just a resource to be consumed. Have you all seen Renfield yet? When Nicolas Cage is playing Dracula, and he's narcissistically abusing um, Renfield, his his familiar, his human slave. It's goofy. It's gory. Um, it's kind of funny. Uh, but most importantly, it's a it's a movie to inspire codependents to leave narcissistically abusive relationships. So its heart is in the right place. Check out uh, Renfield. It's not an amazing movie. Okay, don't shout at me. But I watched it on a plane, and I was like, "Hey, this is pretty good. It's good natured. It's got a it's got a good heart to it." Thanks for keeping it real and humorous, Richard. It helps so much to reset me when I listen. You're okay. They are, you're welcome. I mean, um, but you're okay. You're also okay. Um, it gets dark in there, right? All of this subject, it'd be so dark. And, uh, you know, it is dark. It's not very nice. Um, but it's not that bad. You don't need to be that scared of them. And you don't need to be that full of despair as you are. It's just not that bad. They're not that important. You will recover. You're very strong. You're very resilient. You're the product of millions and millions of years of evolution under far harsher conditions than this and um you'll be okay you'll be okay you can afford to have a sense of humor and laughing at them reminds you how silly they are can a narcissist be afraid of a so-called empath only if that empath is an even bigger narcissistic psychopath than they are i'm an empath where's your manager <laughs> Get me your manager. I'm an indigo child, twin flame empath. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna finish soon. <laughs> uh, okay. LMFAO, Karen Path. <laughs> uh, Richard, have you heard of the decentralized men movement? If so, have any thoughts? No, what, is, what fresh level of hell is this? Uh, decentralized men. men. <laughs> Take the men out of the center. Um, God, that reminds me, there's a line from a movie, and it's a great movie, and I love it. 
Uh, it's called The Devils with Oliver Reed, and it's really disturbing. So don't watch it unless you have a strong stomach. It's not that gory, but it just gets under your skin, like the visuals. You can almost, it takes place in this, uh, the medieval times of the, the witch hunts. And you can kind of like, you almost think you can smell people um, before they start burning them. It's, it's based on a true story of, of uh, women uh, in a nunnery who seem to go into a group um, sexual psychosis over this extremely handsome priest, or was he an abbot? I can't remember, but he's described as being like gorgeous and with a beautiful mustache. And um, yeah, they uh, they had a whole witch hunt, and uh, they eventually taught. This really happened. They they tortured this handsome fellow, um, saying that he used like a satanic um, witchery to bewitch these poor innocent nuns. Um, they broke his legs, poor dude, and then uh, they burnt him alive. And uh, they were supposed to get choked to death first. You know, when they did the burnings, they're supposed to kill. They're sometimes it was more normal for them to kill you before they burn you than not. But um, they didn't with him. Pretty mean. Anyway, decentralized men. What? So why did I think of Oliver Reed? Uh, he says, uh, what fresh lunacy is this? A crocodile? That's one of my favorite lines from all movies of all times. Plus Oliver Reed was great. What is decentralizing men? Um, <laughs> I'm going to enjoy this. Uh, what beliefs, mindsets, or behaviors have you had to unlearn to help you truly decentralize men? What ideas have been subconsciously following that uphold the patriarchy and internalize misogyny? Um, okay. I don't, uh, I'm on Reddit. Maybe I shouldn't be on Reddit. What is this? What does the decentering mean? When you decenter men, you acknowledge that structurally you can organize and destroy it with community, but you can also confront men's place in your world interpersonal. That's not very good grammar. The point is to examine all of the conscious and unconscious ways you place men above your needs and fullness. Um, Decentering men, why you need to let go of men. Oh, it's a medium article. This is going to be jolly good. Uh, you aren't unable to let go of men. You're unwilling to let go of men. What? What is this? <laughs> what is this? You are not unable to let go of half of the human population. You are unwilling. But in time, you will find the strength to cast them into a dark river and watch them drown. <laughs> you are unwilling to let half the human population go. Them go because having one means something to your identity. You are not full, nor do you feel well, unless you are being desired or partnered with a man. Oh, now truly think about this statement. You do not feel like a full human being unless an adult male wants to F you. Thanks, medium, for bringing down the tone or hang out with you. This is how much patriarchy has the world effed up. You're so invested in men that your life collapses once a random person decides to not be around you. Or you're heterosexual and you like men. This sounds like lunacy to me. Oh, but I will say this. I don't think it's a very good idea uh, for anybody to overemphasize uh, the importance of romantic love in their lives. And I do think we've done that. So when I have uh, female friends, and when I used to have female clients, I don't have any clients anymore. We do chat around that a little bit because I do think that it can be a little bit of a weakness, an unnecessary weakness. To, it's it, it's ideological. Sometimes there's a biological instinct, of course. You want to pair bond, you want to have children, and, and so on and so forth. You want to experience love and intimacy and vulnerability. Wonderful. That's fine. How much do you want to, like, will you forego your sanity for it? Will you forego your so sovereignty for it? How far will you go? Um, I don't, yeah. So I have to help a two young women, uh, not professionally, but because I've been asked to. And um, these are some of the things that, that come up, like where are you going to place not so much where you're going to place men in your life, but like where are you going to place love, romance, sex? Um, and it's something everybody needs to think about. Like if you're over centralizing, I don't know about decentralizing men. That's a bit sloppy thinking because that's half the human population. 
Um, but if you're over centralizing love, I think for men and women, that's a problem. And maybe, yes, maybe it is a bit of a vulnerability for women. I wouldn't express it quite the way they have. I'd find my own way to express it. I really worry that we're just going to create so much division and ruin the chance for people to have um, real love and real intimacy in their lives with, because people get traumatized and they get hurt and then they cling to vicious um, non-human ideologies in their pain. And the pain is legitimate. The pain's terrible. Like they've really been hurt. I've really been hurt by terrible women. I've seen women at their worst. The worst animus possessed um, women who are just furious with men and infused with like fourth wave feminism. And it's so sad. And I've really experienced so much pain, but nothing ever, ever made me think I'm going to part ways with women. And if that was what the devil wanted, should have fucking tried harder. <laughs> no, no, we're not parting ways with women. <laughs> I'm not decentralizing women. <laughs> no, I would, I would decentralize love. I would decide, like, you can't, romantic love, I think, if you probably missed the beginning of what I was talking about, uh, I, I really think uh, consumer capitalism and consumerism is ruining the world. And so there is an overemphasis on love, but, our love, our modern love is so sick. It's so um, infused with consumerism. We're really, we're really trying to consume each other and we're really trying to consume love. I mean, look at the language here. I mean, it's, a, it's an art. I'm not going to read it out, um, actually, because it's pretty poisonous. It's an article on Medium called Decentering Men. Um, It's a bit, I get it, I get it, I do I get it. But where's the end goal? Like, is it, so when I, so you can go read, everybody go read Decentering Men on Medium and you come back to this video and you say, I think the objective of that article was to help women overcome the trauma of disappointing relationships or, or, or hurtful relationships, painful, abusive relationships, to eventually bring them back to men and love. Or maybe they don't choose men anymore. Maybe they become gay. Fine. At least you didn't give up. You'd like whatever. Or is it just get rid of half the human population? Because if it's option two, that's poison and you're drinking from a poison goblet, even though you might be drinking for good reasons. It's still a poison chalice. I'm very sad to see it. I'm very, very sad to see it. That was never my response. You know, I never, I never thought, I never thought to blame all women because of the behavior of three, because that doesn't seem reasonable. Maybe I'll try it and I'll write decentering women. <laughs> let's change the, let's change the gender. <laughs> Brothers, you aren't unable to let go of women. You are unwilling to let go of women. You are unwilling to let women go because having a woman means something to your identity. You are not full, nor do you feel well, unless you are being desired or partnered with a woman. Now, truly think about this statement. You do not feel like a full human being, brothers, unless an adult female wants to F you or hang out with you. This, how much, this is how much the matriarchy has the world effed up. You are so invested in women that your life collapses once a, ran, a random person, a random person decides to not be around you. You're not over your breakup, Charlie's Toolbox. You're not over your breakup. What's your name? Charlie's Toolbox. This, this is just not responsible writing. This is just not responsible. You're in pain. You got to go to therapy, man. I know it sucks. It costs money. You got to cry about your childhood, your relationship with your father, with your mother. It's what we all got to do. You got to go to therapy. That is not responsible writing. Her name is Charlie Stallbox. It's a pseudonym. It's a nom de plume. Charlie's toolbox. I would say get in touch, but I don't want to talk to you. 
<laughs> spreading this this poisonous <laughs> all right i'll take one more question and then uh, i will go away um <laughs> I'd love to see you on an interview with Rogan, Richard. Me too. What's wrong? What's wrong with you, Joe? Why haven't you? I'm very, very full of my own self-importance. And I believe that you should invite me because I'm very important to me. <laughs> yeah, maybe one day, you know, I'm, I'll go. I'll go to Texas. I'll go to his uh, comedy club and... Um, I'll be like, oh, 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 that, oh, you're here. Who, who would have, who fancy seeing you in the comedy club that you completely own? <laughs> See if I can, you know, like, let me on your podcast, Rogan. Uh, I need coffee for my identity. I hear you. I hear you. Let, let's do, let's do one more, uh, one more um, question. Let's think about love and unity. Not enough Scouse on Rogan. That's a good point. Now, hang on a second. Speaking of Scousers, has Paddy Pimblett been on Rogan? Because if Paddy Pimblett has been, not been on Rogan, I ain't getting on fucking Rogan. I don't know if he ever was. Paddy Pimblett. Paddy Pimbletto. I think Joe just talks to people he wants to talk to, you know? He's talked about Paddy on his show, but and he's talked to him in the, in the cage, obviously. But no, yeah, not enough Scouse on Rogan. Yes, they should put me on and I can confuse them. What is Scouse? Um, it is the accent of the Merseyside area. It was originally from something that sailors used to eat. Uh, I believe it's a Scandinavian root word called lobscouse. So it was, uh, it was, they would just eat what was left on the ships, which would be a fish stew. Um, that's now called scouse and is actually normally not fish. I think it's normally meat if you eat scouse. It's quite nice, quite a nice stew, nice in the middle of winter. And the accent that I have would be called by people not from the area scouse, but if they were from Liverpool, they would say, you're a fucking wool. So there's like proper scouse. And where I'm from is from a place outside of Liverpool where we have a similar accent, but not a full one. Um, why do I get so worn out after panic attacks? I think um, panic attacks are very, very draining on the um, on the whole system. You know, um, I would really have a go of treating them as uh, emotional flashbacks. You should see a therapist who specialises in this type of thing as well. But I have a course for free. Um, it's on YouTube called um, Fortress Mental Health. And that's a free YouTube channel. There's like a nine module course there that helps people reduce their emotional dysregulation. Probably won't get rid of it completely, but it would bring it down enough that you could then go on to therapy. It must be the air conditioning that's doing this. Sorry about this. Who knows? <clears throat> what Outer Space movie came out in 1992? Listen, mate, I watch TikTok. You won't catch me with... <laughs> nice try, though. <laughs> uh, mm -mm. The adrenaline rush drains you, said someone, and I lost them. Uh, that's very true. Adrenaline, absolutely. Uh, okay. So here's somebody there says, I've done Fortress Mental Health. It's really good. And I do the five things five times every day, and it's really helped. So give that a go. Thank you for that, Amanda. Liverpudlians and Mancunians. I've never known anyone from Liverpool or Merseyside say Liverpudlian. They usually say Scouse. Um, Mancunians are not, not Scouse, if that's, what, if that's what you're saying. Richard is marrying me. No, I'm decentralizing women. I'm sorry. I have decided that um, there's just no more centering of women. Do you have any opinion on the MDR? Every single time I do a Q&A, people ask me this. It should work. Uh, if you have a good relationship with your therapist, it should help a little bit, yeah. Kevin K, can you explain pathological enmeshment as it pertains to NPD? And is it specific to the NPD dynamic? 
going to close this medium article. Pathological enmeshment. Pathological enmeshment is a severe form of child abuse that strips the children down mentally, emotionally, and psychologically and turns them into the narcissistic parents remote control robots. Because the manipulation is stealth, the children do not realize anything has happened to them. That's from randyfine.com. Um, there's a professor who's written on it. Professor Steve Gallick. Stephen Gallick, sorry. Pathological enmeshment is a form of codependence in which two people are so emotionally and behaviorally entangled that they cannot function independently from one another. This can lead to unhealthy patterns of codependent behavior, such as one person enabling another's bad habits or one person sacrificing their own needs in order to please the other. Pathological enmeshment can be harmful to both parties involved and can often lead to codependency problems later in life. This actually sounds far more relevant to borderline personality disorder um, than NPD. In fact, I, in fact, I've gone Scouse because of talking about Scouse. In fact, right. Um, in fact, I think uh, this kind of pathological enmeshment, you know, I have my pet theory of how narcissistic personality disorder is formed and what the structure is. I, I would say that like, um, I would say that like, stop it. I would say that like, you know what I mean, kid? I would say that uh, pathological enmeshment. So for narcissistic personality disorder, we have to have a polarity between abuse and putting the child on a pedestal and over um, pandering to their needs at the same time. With BPD, you would have to have this pathological enmeshment with, and I think the rage attacks, this is me pontificating, not the orthodoxy. I think the rage attacks that is one of the nine traits that clinicians look for to give a borderline personality disorder diagnosis is that child raging out against the enmeshment, which is an invasion of the child's psychic and emotional space by a highly narcissistic parent who enmeshes with them and then mutates their reality. And then they're just raging trying to escape that that slavery um as it pertains to mpd is it specific to the mpd dynamic the npd it, i don't think um i think the npd would do that to somebody the npd parent would do that to their child i don't think you'd have to have pathological enmeshment as i just read it being described in order to create an npd person except and then somebody's gonna to have to tell me because i don't really know about pathological enmeshment except except if pathological enmeshment is considered almost synonymous to a parent placing their drives and desires into the child um aggressively like you know forcing that into the the, the vessel that the child represents um, if that's also a part of pathological enmeshment, then yes. If not, then no. Hope that helps. In Trinidad and Tobago, Souse, are you saying Scouse or Souse is a traditional soup made with pig's feet? I'm going to have to come to Trinidad and Tobago then. Can I have some? That sounds absolutely vile. <laughs> the green pig's feet. <laughs> oh dear, I couldn't. I couldn't do it. I used to go dim sum with my uh, with my mates down in London, and so, sometimes up in Liverpool as well. And they try and get me to eat like the chicken's claw and the the the, the tripe and the intestines. I was like, I'm not doing it. <laughs> I'm not doing it. I'll have one of those buns with the bacon inside of it. I'll have a char siu bao, please. Hey, do was a char siu bow over here. Would those episodes help an ADHD teenager, Richard? It depends. Well, if they've got ADHD, they'd have to sit and watch it. Um, so probably not. Possibly not. I mean, um, I do think ADHD is like I, I. Somebody else gave me this. An old psychologist who I met when I was taking out the bins one day. True story. 
uh, told me this. He said that he thinks ADHD would be better defined as adrenophilia. So you're actually an adrenophiliac. You're addicted to being high on your own adrenaline through overstimulation. Go, 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 go. And that is considered a flight response in um, complex post-traumatic stress disorder. So in CPTSD terms, if you can help overcome the emotional flashback of the flight response, then yes, it would help with the ADHD if that's if that's what it was, yeah. Rogan, one word, Rogan. Who are you, Rogan? Rogan yourself. How do you know when you're the toxic one and when it's a red flag? Um, ah, are you not bad? <laughs> if you're being mean and deliberately exploiting people and you're being cruel, then you're the toxic one. Uh, I hope that helps. Fortress saved my life, works like a charm, still do do it if I feel dysregulated. Thank you for that, Eva. That's that's uh, good to hear. I'm glad it's helped. Gabor Mate discusses the correlation with ADHD and trauma. Yes, he does. I like Gabor Mate. forget the brown sauce Kevin I <laughs> that we can just have like serious discussions of psychiatric clinical entities and just <laughs> gibberish references uh <clears throat> adrenophilia where did they that's not mine that's and I don't know the guy's name I had a, a book on um what was it oh I'd found out that he was a, he was an ex-psychiatrist retired and and I had a book that I wanted to give him. And he was like, don't give me any more fucking books. I've read enough fucking books. He's, he's, he's an older fella. Uh, but we were putting the bins out and I said hello to him one day and I just went over and had a chat with him. And somehow we got onto ADHD and that was when he said to me, I think I think it's a adrenophilia. Um, so I don't know how to credit him. Old fella, old psychiatrist over the road from me who put the bins out. Doctor, old psychiatrist with the bins out. Okay, I'm not really seeing that many questions. A lot of people chatting to each other. That's nice. Poe and the rock stars here. Hello, Poe. Beans and toast, says Kevin. You're just making me hungry now, Kevin. Oh, it's not Scouse. It's Souse. Souse. Seuss. Probably Seuss. Is it? Are you, are you speaking French down there? I don't know. I've never been to Trinidad and Tobago. The closest I've been. I've not been close at all. To that part of the world. The closest I've been is Dominican. Why do narcissists play mind games? You've asked this question a few times. Everything that they do is a mind game. Everything is um, is a provocation. Everything is there to create a reaction in you. We've already done one sci-fi analogy. I'll give you one more sci-fi analogy and then I'll leave. Um, I used to be a consultant for a consultant psychologist for video games. Yes, I'm not making that up. It was a short lived job, but it was a real job. And um, there was one of the um, ideas, and I think this actually did become a game, but it wasn't wasn't one that I'd worked on. Was um, what you fought in the game was a cloud of nanobots that would manifest as your worst fear. So uh, let's say sci-fi scenario like events arise and you go across the solar system and you find the old ship that's empty and we don't know what's happened to the crew. And then you make your way in the video game, you form a lock and then you make your way inside only to find all of your worst horrors manifest as a form of artificial intelligence manifesting as a cloud of nanobots that can turn into anything. They can show up as anything. They can be anything and they're tactile. They can actually literally physically hurt you as well. But what they're doing is they're scanning you for your worst nightmare. So whoever meets them, whatever their worst nightmare is, they become that to elicit as much fear as possible. Pretty cool idea for a sci-fi horror game. Okay. Now imagine the same concept, but this cloud of nanobots, that, that might want to induce laughter in you. It might want to induce lust or admiration or whatever potent emotional reaction it can get from you or others in the environment 
to elicit the, re the human reactions that it wants because it is feeding on human reaction. Everything the narcissistic personality disordered individual does is to acquire more narcissistic supply. I'm trying to be good and give you like information that's actually come from proper sources. Okay, I want the history of it. Okay, all right, history of narcissistic supply. Um, building on Freud's concept of narcissistic satisfaction and on the work of his colleague, the psychoanalyst Carl Abraham, Otto Fenichel in 1938 highlighted the narcissistic need in early development for supply to enable young children to maintain a sense of mental equi equilibrium. He identified two main strategies for obtaining such narcissistic supplies, aggression and ingratiation, the fight fawn response from CPTSD kids, contrasting styles of approach, which could later develop into the sadistic and the submissive respectively. Um, the concept was introduced by Otto Fenichel in 1938 to describe a type of admiration, interpersonal support, or sustenance drawn by an individual from his or her environment and essential to their self-esteem. Uh, Otto Fenichel is a was a psychiatrist, uh, sorry, a psychoanalyst. And he studied in medicine in Vienna he was attracted by the circle of psychoanalysts around Freud. I mean, we should listen to him. So it's a concept, uh, sorry, brain not braining. Did I say 1938? I did, didn't I? 1938, 1938. So everything that they're doing is to acquire more narcissistic supply. And it's a childish need to acquire narcissistic supply. As he's just said, it would either be through bullying and sadism and through aggression or through ingratiation and fawning and seduction and being funny or being submissive or um, being very, paying you a lot of compliments and appealing to your vanity. Uh, so of course they're playing mind games. There's nothing else. The narcissistic personality disordered individual is one long mind game. It's a mirage. And you'll be thinking, no, there's a person, they have a heart, I've held them, I've looked into their eyes, I've seen them cry, I've listened to them breathing when they're asleep. I know, I know, I know, but it's a mirage. There's, there's nobody home. There's nobody home. And the mind game is all there is for them to get what they want from you. Oh, that's a good question. Um, how do I find a therapist? Is, let me give you some practical advice to finish with. So it, I, it doesn't matter what country you're in. You should be able to oh, go online <clears throat> and search for a counseling or therapist's directory. You don't have to sit face to face in the same room as your therapist in order to get benefits from therapy. Once you found a therapist or counselor's directory, you can search in the tags. These, these websites are really good now. They have search functions. You want to know if they're into NPD, CPTSD, those specific modalities you want to work with, like EMDR or DBT or CBT. You can find all that. You can specify it. And you can even say, I only want to work online. Then what you can do is you can pick your top five that you like the look of, you like the sound of, you like the way they're working because they usually write an introduction and they say, this is our work. And then you go to each one of them and you say, hey, I'm thinking about getting therapy. Would you mind if I have a 10 minute conversation with you just to see if we're a good fit? Nine times out of 10, they'll say yes, unless they are absolutely chocker. And if they're chocker, you can't work with them. They're, I mean, full, if they're full, if their appointment book is full, then you can't work with them anyway. Um, means they're probably really good and you should keep them on the back burner and message them again in a couple of months or tell them to put you on a waiting list. Um, then you go and chat to them. You chat to all five of your therapists, your qualified counselors, therapists, your qualified clinicians, and then um, you choose your top one and, and, and you get started. That's how to choose a therapist or a counselor. That's how I chose my last therapists and counselors. And um, I love it. It's great. It's like having a superpower. 
going to therapy is a very, very good thing if you're working with the right person. Um, you said something about how do you stop them from going into the past? You are going to have to go into your past a little bit, even if you don't want to. It's just um, it's just part of the process, I'm afraid. That's an hour and 30, and I think that's long enough. I'm going to be doing a live webinar next week on social anxiety. Um, and I'm going to release a course on overcoming social anxiety. So if that's something you're interested in, go over to richardgrannon.com, scroll down the homepage until you find my newsletter, join the newsletter, and I'll be releasing details tomorrow about how to sign up for that. So there's a course, a new course on overcoming social anxiety, and we'll be doing a live webinar on social anxiety this time next Sunday, next week. Um, that date is when people are watching this in the future, which will then be the past. What? You're bending time. So on the twentieth, on uh, Sunday, October the 22nd of 2023 at 9 p.m. Dubai time, we'll be doing that webinar. If you're interested, please join the mailing list over on richardgrannon.com. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and for your attention. Please take care of yourselves. And I look forward to being with you all very soon. Thank you.